Hi guys, this is Dr. Gillard. As promised, I have put together something to replace the missing class we had last week because of the holiday. And as I got into this, I realized this is pretty complex. The just the basic anatomy, physiology, and biomechanics of the temporal mandibular joint. So I spent quite a bit of time putting this together for you because if you don't understand the anatomy and biomechanics, it's going to be really hard to understand what's going on. So let's spend some time talking about the anatomy and biomechanics of the temporal mandibular joint. So here we go. And copyright uh, stuff here, everything is copyrighted. Um, I think everything on here is by Okasun 2013, all rights reserved. Uh, this is being used under fair use. Uh, via 17 USC section 107 etc all right osteology some basics now I know you've had this in anatomy 1 and 2 but uh, let's just go over this real quickly this of course is the mandible this is a side view of the skull this is the body of the mandible here this is the ramus we'll talk about that origins and insertions of muscles this is the angle uh, of the mandible right here which is important then of course this is the TMJ joint the temporal mandibular joint which is made up the uh, condylar process here of the mandible there's a bunch of AKs for that it's also called the uh, mandibular process some people just call it the the process of it's all kinds of AKs for it it the condylar process or the head of the condylar process specifically fits into this cavity right here and that's called the mandibular fossa uh, gleno what's another one for gleno cavity there's there's a bunch of but we're going to call it the mandibular process up here is the coronoid process of the mandible mass that asserts here as we'll see so when i talk about the anterior portion of the ramus of the mandible, this is would be the lateral anterior portion of the ramus of the mandible. This would be the posterior lateral portion here. On the other side, which we can't see, would be the medial surface. Okay, zygomatic arch here is up here, of course. This would be the the zygomatic process of the mandibular bone. This would be the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. Temporal fossa is up here. Okay, you guys got that down. Let's look at the actual condylar process here of the mandible. This is the, the thing we just saw, right? We go back here. This is this region right here. Okay, we can see we have two main parts. We have a head that is the actual articulation for it. This contains the fibrocartilage. Uh, very strange here, too. This does not is not covered with hyaline cartilage like a diarthroidal joint would have like your knee or your wrist or your elbow instead it's just a fibrocartilage but it has specialized cells that uh, put out synovial fluid so it is a synovial joint it does have synovial fluid in it it's also a little strange that the the width is greater than the depth of this bone the medial pole is right here lateral pole these are connections for um, some ligaments talk more about that in a minute here's another view of the temporal mandibular joint again the mandibular process uh, in the resting position articulates and is positioned within the mandibular fossa now when you open your jaws we're gonna see it doesn't stay in this fossa like you may think uh, up after about 25 millimeters of, of opening it has to jump over this knob here. This is the articular eminence or the articular process of the uh, mandibular bone. So this is an important player. We've all felt that little click when you open your jaw. Some people louder than others. Well, this is why, because it's translating over this. We'll talk about that a little bit in a little bit here. So let's get into the functional anatomy here of this joint. You can see this is a big picture. I've labeled everything, but let's kind of zoom in one thing before I zoom in last decade or so we've learned that uh, the the lateral pterygoid which we used to think was just one muscle actually in the the old notes that we're using it actually has it as one muscle there's actually a superior head and an inferior head 
and the superior head has a different action. It actually attaches into the articular disc, which we're going to talk about in a minute here. So about 40% of the fibers go in here, 60% attach into the condyle, so that's pretty interesting. Let's zoom in a little bit. So the disc is, just like the disc in the spine, the disc is thought to be a major cause of people with chronic temporal mandibular uh, joint disorder. And it has three parts. And just like the disc in the spine, it's pretty much avascular, except there's some microvasculature and blood around the periphery of the disc. Uh, but it has, and it does have an outer annulus region, but that's kind of beyond the scope here. The thing we need to know is it has three parts or three zones. It has an anterior, a very thick anterior band. And then it has a thinner intermediate zone, and this is where all the action of, of movement actually occurs. <clears throat> and then it has a posterior band, which is also very thick. Now this is a sagittal view, or looking at you from the side of your right TMJ joint. Uh, you can see that to stabilize this disc, we have some structures here in the back. These are the retrodiscal laminae. We have a superior and inferior retrodiscal laminae. And you can see that one connects right into this band here. This is the joint capsule or the capsular ligament. The inferior lamina actually circles around and attaches back into the condyle. So this stabilizes the disc and keeps it from sloshing around in there. This is a very tight fit in here, right? It's under quite a bit of pressure, so everything has to be held in place. Now in the center here, this is the retrodiscal tissue. This is very important. And it's filled with blood vessels. It looks like fat here, but it's not fat. It's filled with blood vessels and nerves. And it can be a, become a source of chronic pain. In fact, that's one of the leading theories is where most of the pain comes from with people with chronic TMJ problems. Anteriorly, it's stabilized by the, by the lateral pterygoid, but specifically the superior ahead of the lateral pterygoid stabilizes this part of the disc. Also note that we have two important spaces here. This black space, that's the inferior joint cavity, and this space on the top is the superior joint cavity. And these are filled with synovial uh, fluid. And uh, this, again, this is a true diarthroidal joint. Um, it's a little bit different though. I won't get into the name. It's quite complicated to name the joint, but Actually, it's a combination of a hinge joint uh, and a gliding joint or because it rotates and translates, but that's beyond the scope of this. But just know that what is testable is that the first half of jaw opening occurs in this inferior joint cavity, uh, and the articulation would be uh, between the mandibular condyle and the inferior surface of the disc, specifically in the intermediate zone. After 25 degrees, when this condyle has to jump over this articular eminence, then we have a change that the later stages of jaw opening occur between the superior part of the disc and the articular eminence or articular process, some people call it, of the temporal bone. So uh, important stuff and testable. I, I may ask you about that where the second phase of jaw opening occurs and you say the superior joint cavity between the superior part of the disc and the articular eminence. Uh, that's definitely testable material. All right, I think that's all we need to say. Let's move on. Now here's a cadaveric specimen. Uh, again, you can see that the intermediate uh, zone is definitely thinner and there's a better looking anterior band and a posterior band. In a normal closed mouth position, notice that the 12 o'clock position uh, of the mandibular condyle is right over the posterior band. Uh, why do you need to know this? Because if you have someone with chronic uh, TMJ pain, you're going to probably want to get an MRI, so you're going to need to at least know what some of these structures look like. And the MRI uh, looks exactly like this. So this is normal. Now let's talk about some of these important ligaments. The entire TMJ joint is encapsulated by uh, a capsular ligament, or the joint capsule, if you will, and it uh, connects basically the temporal bone to the neck of the condylar process. 
uh, it's airtight and holds in the cerebral spinal fluid. It's also well innervated. So your typical uh, patient who comes in with TMJ, they might have an irritation. They might have just like any other ligament and you can get an inflammation of this tissue. Uh, it's well innervated. Uh, so you can get a pain syndrome from here. Uh, it also has proprioceptive function, so it gives the joint, uh, you know, it's beyond the scope of this, but it kind of tells the brain where the joint is in space. Now the lateral ligaments are pretty important. These would be uh, over the top of the capsular ligament. Capsular ligament has been removed here, but we have uh, two distinct fibers. Both of these arise, if I remember right, they both arise from the a zygomatic arch, but more importantly the oblique fibers actually wrap around and insert into the neck here uh, of the condylar process. This is another the same picture. This is a right TMJ uh, joint here. The front of the patient would be over here. This would be the back. There's the styloid process. So, um, so these fibers are, are pretty important. Why? Because this kind of ends the party. When you first open your jaw uh, the condylar process is very happy. It's it's pu does pure rotation in the in the mandibular fossa here. Everything is happy, but at about 25 millimeters of opening, all of a sudden this ligament pulls tight, and the party's over. So no more rotation can occur by itself. So therefore, in order to open your mouth, you have to this. Uh, translates forward. You have A to P translation and it literally, and we'll look at this more in a minute, it literally jumps over the the articular eminence. And it's because of these fibers right here. But you know you can't cut them of course. They they're needed for stability. So that's very testable. I may ask you what 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 ends the party? Why does the the why does the joint have to or why does the condyle have to kind of jump ship? And the reason is because these oblique fibers of the lateral ligament, I forgot to mention, uh, collectively, uh, these two are called the lateral ligament or the temporal mandibular ligament. Uh, then we have some transverse fibers as well. And do I have that wrong here? I do, I have that backwards. So this is not correct here. The transverse fibers, uh, I call these the Mike Tyson fibers uh, because they actually protect that delicate retrodiscal tissue we talked about. If you get punched in the jaw and it drives your mandible this way, remember that sensitive tissue is right back here, uh, these transverse fibers will become very taut and they will actually break the uh, mandibular process off or fracture it before it lets it go into that tissue. So these are very strong. Sorry about that. I'll fix that. But this is a first take. If I do a second take, it'll be fixed. But Okay, let's take a look at an A to P view of that right condylar process, which again contains the neck of the condylar process is here, and the head of the condylar process. There's two more important ligaments, which are called the discal ligaments, because they connect the condylar process with the disc. So there's the lateral discal, and there's the medial discal ligaments. Um, the AKA, I believe, was just collateral ligaments, but we're going to call them discal ligaments. So I might ask you what stabilizes the disc laterally or medially, and you would say the lateral medial discal ligaments. Here's the disc here. You can see the joint cavity, inferior joint cavity would be here. Superior joint cavity is here. This is all filled with cerebral spinal or not cerebral spinal fluid, with synovial fluid. Uh, and this right would be the capsular ligament. And you can see how the capsular ligament works. Nice, nice picture here. And we went over that already. Now we have some accessory ligaments. There's a huge error in Gray's Anatomy, the 150th anniversary Gray's, which cost like $300. Huge error. Um, it's the stylomandibular ligament that is the key accessory ligament. There's two, stylomandibular ligament which of course goes to the styloid process to the mandible, man, or, uh, mandible. And then there's the sphenomandibular ligament. It's the sphenomandibular ligament, inserts into the lingula here, uh, has no function really that we're concerned with. It doesn't limit opening uh, or anything. Grace has these 
mixed around and goes on and on about these ligaments. Uh, but it's the stylomandibular ligament that is the key ligament because it almost single-handedly limits uh, excessive protrusion. What's protrusion? If you do a bulldog with your jaw, stick your jaw out like a bulldog, that's protrusion. If you pull it back, that's retrusion. Now let's get into the muscles. So muscles of mastication. Now these are all going to be testable because I'm going to actually have you uh, demonstrate how to palpate these. And we're looking for trigger points, areas of tight, tender fibers uh, that can be related to pain. Sometimes a patient may have a problem way up here in the temporalis uh, causing pain in the T, referring pain to the TMJ. So we need to uh, find these trigger points and we can treat these. So masseter muscle is one of the power, it's a powerful, uh, what do you call it when you close the jaw to chew? It's called elevation, so it's a pow powerful elevator. You can see it's attached to zygoid, uh, or the zygomatic arch here. We're going to be able to palpate. You should palpate this muscle, the origin. You should palpate the insertion of this as well. It inserts basically on the the ramus of the mandible and the angle of the mandible, even a little bit of the body of the mandible. Uh, and it kind of wraps around inferiorly. It meets, it forms a sling with another muscle we're going to talk about. Um, but you should be able to palpate this and know where this muscle is. Uh, we talked about its action, uh, elevation. Its secondary action is what? It's protrusion. So it's a weak protruder. Temporalis muscle, uh, very important. Note that it has three fibers. I'm going to ask you to palpate. Maybe I'll just ask you to palpate the posterior fibers. So make sure you know the direction because we need to look for trigger points in this muscle as well. It rises from the temporal fossa. Well, you guys can read this. Uh, it inserts, this is important, it forms a common tendon, inserts on the coronoid process and the anterior of the ramus. It goes all the way down to the molar. I don't think the picture really does it justice here. And this is really the only muscle that we can definitely palpate uh, interorally, uh, and we will be doing that. They used to think that you can palpate the pterygoids in there, and you really can't. There's been research on that, uh, and our ability to palpate that is poor. We're going to learn about a technique, if we have time, uh, called functional manipulation uh, that can kind of zero in and make the diagnosis of a dysfunctional pterygoid muscle rather than go in there and try to palpate it. I mean, medial pterygoid you can palpate, but you make people gag because it's way back there by the uh, where the gag reflex starts in the oropharynx. Okay, I don't want to make this too long, so we'll try to keep moving along here. Now here's the medial pterygoid. I said there's a sling action. Now we're looking uh, at a view medial to lateral and this is the other side of the mandible and you can see we have a medial pterygoid you can read about it here uh, it's double headed again uh, but this also is a very powerful elevator of the jaw now lateral pterygoids are very important it's a small but important muscle here this is the one we talked about a little bit already remember we said the superior uh, the superior portion of the lateral pterygoid actually inserts into the disc and neck of the articular or of the condylar process so it's very important let's talk a bit about it so the, again the superior lateral pterygoid right arises from the greater wing of the sphenoid and inserts into the anterior neck and into the articular disc and its action which is important you need to know everything about this it stabilizes the condyle during uh, power uh, loading of the mandible, which is chewing. So that's important that that you know we can treat that muscle with patients with function. Uh, but that's kind of beyond the scope of this video. Uh, but it's an important muscle. Inferior pterygoid is kind of a multi-purpose muscle. It's also important. Lateral pterygoid plate rises and inserts into the neck of the condyle. Uh, it's very important for mandibular protrusion or doing the bulldog sticking your pointing your chin forward. Uh, that's testable. You need to know that. Uh, secondary actions are important too. Uh, 
especially depression. We haven't talked about anything that actually opens the mouth or depresses the mandible, so it's important there. Uh, also, lateral to medial motions of the mandible, mandible are done by the inferior lateral pterygoid. Those are actually caused if you move the jaw medial, one joint medial toward the midline, that's called medial trusion, and the other joint would laterally trude. So more terminology. You don't need to know that, though. That's beyond the scope here, I think. Maybe that might be a bonus question, medial and lateral trusion. Mandibular, or the main depressors, however, and we've covered these muscles in other anatomy classes, but the digastric, geniohyoid, myelohyoid, uh, and then the inferior lateral pterygoid we've talked about, but uh, we're going to palpate those. You can, when you do an examination of you want to palpate these for trigger points, especially the, uh, the digastrics as well. So those are important. Now, the uh, articular disc we kind of talked about. This is just a quick little review of it. Again, you can see the stabilizing laminae here, and you can see the uh, pterygoid muscle here, the superior lateral pterygoid stabilizing it. But let's talk about how this thing opens and try to end uh, wind this up here. Okay, let's talk about the articular disc uh, and the joint space here. Now we covered a lot of this, but it's so important. You know, I think I went through all this uh, again. Um, again, the inferior joint cavity is where the initial 25 millimeters of jaw opening occur. And then after that point, remember when that ligament gets tight, the oblique fibers of the mandibular ligament or lateral ligament become tight, the party's over, now the condyle has to translate and actually jump ship over the articular process that occurs in the superior joint cavity. I think that's all we really need to say about that. The, the other testable, probably not maybe for class, I don't know what he's teaching you in class, but uh, board, this is important that the, the superior retrodiscal laminae, which is right here, uh, isn't doesn't have the same histological makeup. It's actually made up of a lot of elastic fibers, which makes sense because it kind of has to control the the moving of this disc. Now, last thing here, and we're done. Biomechanics uh, of depression and elevation. How does the mouth open? Okay, this is the starting position. We talked about this already. Uh, how the 12 o'clock position. This again. Let's get you start. Here's the back. Here's the front. Uh, this is the right condyle. So, quick recap. Uh, we have the head here of the condyle is aligned right over the pad here, the posterior pad. Uh, all the rotation, the pure rotation, initial rotation is going to be right over, over here over this thin intermediate zone. Okay, and here's the cadaveric specimen again. Covered most of this. Now, here's 25 degrees. If I go back and forth between these two, Look right here, you can see see how that first 25 degrees is pretty much pure, pure rotation. But then the party's going to be over. Okay, so this is 25, not degrees, 25 millimeters of rotation. Now that oblique ligament's going to get tight and to translate further, now we can all feel that little click sometimes or feel that little movement as we start to go over the, what was this called here, the articular eminence or the articular tubercle. So this picture shows wide open mouth. Now we can see we're still, this is important for MRI uh, because normal functioning joint, we're still going to be over the intermediate fibers here uh, where it's thin. Uh, but now we're not in the condylar fossa anymore. Now we're over the articular eminence. So, here they might have went a little too far in this drawing, or this cadaveric specimen, but... Okay, well, I hope that got you up to speed on the anatomy. Uh, now, if time permits, we're going to make another one of these to go over the examination. My grandson was sick this weekend, so we couldn't do that. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, uh, but I will definitely be in touch. Uh, and I do owe you an, a, a review as well which will be coming. I'm not sure if I'll do that on paper or make a quick screencast. So good luck on that final, which is this coming Friday. I guess I should say the date today is the 1st of December 2014.